Well, welcome back to the Biblical Communicator. And that is what we desire to be, right? Biblical communicators. The world is filled with atheistic communicators and hedonistic communicators and agnostic communicators, communicators advocating every market and every industry and every ism that's out there. Even the pulpits of America are filled with quasi-biblical communicators. But our goal is to be a biblical communicator so that when we say, thus saith the Lord, truly, thus saith the Lord. And we've got an interesting lesson this morning, this afternoon, whatever time it is for you. But let me pray for us as we get going. Because God, I would ask that you would open our eyes, you'd open our mind, that you would speak. God, again, we're grateful for those who've gone before us, who took the time and studied to show themselves approved, but also to make your word clear to us. Would you use us in that same vein? I pray it, Lord Jesus, that you would get the glory. Amen. Amen. Well, okay, if you remember uh, what we're doing is we are starting with the text, right? We're not starting with our ideas of what a good message is or a message I really want to preach. We're going to the Word of God and we are seeking not to be creative here. We are seeking to be scholars here and students here and unbiased journalists digging deep with every resource at our disposal to understand, unearth what Paul's big idea was. We're going to try to get into the mind of the Apostle Paul as he wrote this. We're going to try to get into the mind of the Ephesians as they read it. We're going to even try to get into the mind of the Holy Spirit. What was it that the Holy Spirit was seeking to communicate in this text that's the big idea. That's what we're after. And when we get that, then we go to our world, our modern world. And we don't want to construct a, a sermon that is for generic modern people, but for your specific people. And actually, here's where we can be creative. We're not preaching a different message than what is in the ancient world. We're just cloaking it. We're, we're forming it for our specific people. You can imagine that the message is going to change if you are preaching in downtown Manhattan or, or if you're in rural Kansas. If you are teaching uh, junior high school students in the suburbs someplace, or if you are teaching seniors in the nursing home someplace. If you are in a depressed economic area, or if you are in a, an affluent Ivy League neighborhood, the way you're going to cloak this big idea is going to be determined by your congregation. So you come up with a big idea, you're all ready, then what? Well, that's a good question. And that's what we're looking at today. You develop an outline. And you might say, well, okay, let's start real simple. What is an outline? Well, an outline is simply the skeleton of your message. There's no, no fat here. Uh, no uh, tendons or muscles. This is really bare bones, right? These are the different elements of your, your sermon. They should fit on one page and it's just to, it's like a map, just giving you a, a guide for where you're going. Now, first element that you see in your introduction, in your outline is an introduction. We're going to talk about that actually in our next class a little bit more specifically. But you have your introduction. Then you have what's called the body. And you might list out the text that you're going to be using. Uh, then you have point one, text and supporting material, point uh, transition. A point two, text and supporting material, another transition. Point three, text and supporting material. Let me stop you for just a moment. Sometimes folk will ask, how many points do I need in my message? And the answer is simply, well, how many points are there in your text? We let the text determine this. Okay, so some messages may have two subpoints, or they may have more, but we just want to make sure it's manageable, memorable for our people. If we give them way too many, we give them 37 points, they're obviously not going to remember any of them, so it has to be manageable. And then in your introduction, you have your conclusion. So you can fit all of this really on one page. Well, there's a purpose of an outline. 
And this is important because you're in your study and you're racking your head and you're saying, you know what, can't I just get up and preach God's word? Why do I need to have this outline? Well, there's a couple of reasons that are pretty important. First of all, it's to organize for clarity for your congregation. Now, think about this for a minute. You are not going to hand out your outline to your people. They will never see it, but they will certainly know if you don't have one. If you don't have one, this is what the kind of things you're going to be hearing at the end of the service. Well, they might be too kind to tell you. They'll tell each other at the Cracker Barrel later on the day. But they would say things like, I couldn't follow him. I had no idea where she was going. Yeah, he lost me early on. Yeah, something wasn't right. I didn't get it. And so this organizes things for clarity for your, your, your people. It also brings clarity for yourself. And this is in this way. It helps you to think clearly on the passage. When you're preaching, you're going to have all these people staring at you. And you're going to have over here this lady having a baby. And the baby's crying. And you can't figure out why they don't just take this kid out. And, and that's, that's unnerving you a little bit. And then over here, there's going to be a couple that gets up and walks out. And you're wondering if you said something offensive. Lots of distractions. But this helps you to stay on point. It helps you to be clear uh, where, where you're going. An outline helps you see how the pieces fit together. It helps you see how the whole text is laid out. I mean, personally, I am a verbal or a audible a uh, visual learner. And when I can see the text, how it lays out, it, it is great for, my, great for my memory. It helps you see obvious holes. If you're looking through your outline and suddenly you notice as you're staring down your outline that you haven't done anything with these verses, you're just skipping over these verses, that should tell you something. Also, it helps you gauge your time. When you preach, there's an expectation that you're going to hit whatever your church or tradition is or group 35 minutes. Well, if you go 15 minutes, the children's workers are going to be very upset at you. And if you go 55 minutes, the children's workers are going to be very upset at you. Plus, you will have lost your whole congregation, you know, 20 minutes earlier. And so it helps you to gauge your time. An outline is critical for these things. There are some elements of a good outline that we just got to get down into our mind. This is why we're, we're doing this. These are the pieces of a good outline. First of all, it is from the text. Now, now hear me. If you've got point one over here coming from this text, and then point two, you have to go to a different text to make it, and then point three, you have to go to a completely different text, what you have is a topical sermon, which is fine and should be preached on occasion intentionally, but, but what we're talking about is all of your points coming from one text. Stay in the text, right? It also, you know that your outline is something that's discovered more than it's created. We are not imposing our will on the text. We're not going there taking a text and trying to put our ideas to it, making it alive. We're going to figure out the logic of Paul's argument or figure out the, the points of Moses' sermon or the, 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 the thoughts of, of this parable that Jesus is telling. Though that will be our outline. So um, it's, it's discovered more than it is created. All points, all points are really sub-points. Each message has one big idea. And all of your points are just subpoints to it. They all point back to the big idea. If they don't point back to the big idea, it will come off in your people's minds very random. Uh, it will be hard for them to follow. And here's the deal. Here's what you know about your people. They have got all kinds of distractions. They have got their, their issues at home. They've got uh, social media things. They, they've got the big game going on. And if they can't follow you, if they get lost, their mind won't stay lost. It just will revert to one of these other distractions. And they will be there physically uh, for your sermon, but they will not be uh, listening to it. So we want to be clear in our, in our uh, outline. Now let me give you an example. Let's just say 
that you've decided to preach on John 3, 16, right? You're not going to do the whole Nicodemus story. You're not going to spend all, all John 3. You're just focusing on John 3, 16. And, and your big idea there is that everybody needs to believe in Jesus. That's, let's say that's your, your big idea, John 3, 16. Everybody needs to be, believe in Jesus. You got that down. And so you, you write your, your outline. And your outline, remember, you're not handing it out. It is for you. And so you're not going to include everything in it, but just enough to help you remember where you're going. Maybe you've got a personal story of when, when I believed in Santa Claus and then that day that Bill Halloran told me he wasn't real and all of the devastation and angst and, and anger that it created and jadedness. You know, you thought you can't believe in anything. Is there anything we can believe in? And then you present to your people, well, yeah, there's, there's one thing that we need to believe in. We need to believe in Jesus, and there's three reasons why we should believe in Jesus. And so, that's your body. First point is we should believe in Jesus because he is God's love gift. For God so loved the world that he gave. And maybe at this point, you're going to have a, maybe show a video clip of a man on the street interview trying to figure out what people think the meaning of love is and how ludicrous that can be. And then you define love for them and you end up telling them that if, if anyone gives you a love gift, it's appropriate. You want to embrace it if it's truly a love gift. And then a second point is that we should believe in Jesus because he's God's son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And maybe with that, you're going to spend a little bit of time uh, demonstrating the deity of Jesus. And this is not just a simple man. He wasn't an angel. He was 100% man and 100% God. And you're going to focus on that. Maybe you've got a personal illustration from the day, that one day way back when, when Tom Cruise came to your home for dinner. And it, you were so excited that somebody so significant as Tom Cruise was coming to your home. And you cleaned up your home and you were looking forward to it. If we do that for someone like Tom Cruise, Jesus is God and he can be ours. We can align ourselves with him. And then your third point, perhaps we believe in Jesus because he is the only way to eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And there you're going to define eternal life. What does that mean? You're going to talk about how Jesus secures eternal life for us and then you're going to go into your conclusion and maybe you have an illustration of uh, getting a, a lotto ticket the winning lotto ticket worth hundreds of millions of dollars but if you don't cash it in it's worth nothing you have to do something how do you cash in on Jesus death how do you believe in Jesus and so you'll talk about that and uh, end your message with an invitation. But you can get all of that on a uh, single page. That's your outline. That's your outline. Now, let me mention this, because this will come into play with an outline. And these words that I'm going to put up here, I need to let you know on the front end that they are categories that we're not familiar with, and therefore, it would be easy for you to turn off right now. But listen to me, you need to turn on right now more than ever. And so if you're doing dishes right now, kind of wipe your hands and just focus, turn off the television, put that other book down, just get into your back room and just focus for a moment because here's a decision you will make, but maybe you don't understand all the options available to you. Maybe you think there's only one option, but you need to know the decision that you will make regarding the direction you go with your message. There's one of three ways you can go with your message, okay? Stay with me now. You can go deductive. Now, deductive sermon, what a deductive sermon does is right at the front end, like in the introduction, you unveil everything. You give them the big idea. You may give them your points. You let them know exactly where you're going in the message. And then all your message is doing is unpacking what you've already laid out for them. That's a deductive message. Uh, if you've ever listened to Tim Keller, I think this is the only way Tim preaches. He will say, this passage teaches us three things about the love of God. It teaches us that the love of God is powerful, that it is good, and that it is enduring. And 
those are his points. And then he will spend the whole rest of his message unpacking those points. That's a deductive message. Then there is a semi-inductive uh, message. A semi-inductive message is probably the most popular. It can be easily preached among all genres of Scripture. And in a semi-inductive message, what you do is you're letting the people know the problem that the text of the day represents, but you're not letting them know the answer. Okay, you're creating within them attention. You're helping them see that there's a huge problem here uh, that they have in their heart. How do we solve it? And then your message unveils your big idea as you go. Then there's also a third way you can go, and that's a inductive message where you state your big idea at the end. Now, let me give you an, an example how you might do this. Let's just say that you've decided to preach uh, 1 Samuel 17, the David and Goliath story, right? And let's, you can preach that David and Goliath story uh, deductively, semi-inductively, or inductively. And so you've got to make the decision. And so let's just say you want to go deductively with that. And you might start your message off saying, isn't it true that it's so easy to make commitments for Christ and then not follow through. The, the making the commitments is, is, is easy. Or we might struggle in making them, but following them through, well, that's a whole different battle. And how many times have we made commitments to Christ to, to spend more time in his word or to share our faith or to not do that sin only to fail and fail and fail? Well, those who know the promises of God and the character of God will succeed, succeed, succeed. Victory comes for those who know the promises and the character of God. And today, we're going to look at a young man who knew the promises and the character of God and how understanding those things helped him to keep that which he knew to be true. And then, then you just go ahead and preach the rest of the David in Goliath's story. But let's just say you want to preach David and Goliath, but you want to preach it on a semi-inductive manner, okay? Well, how might you start off your message? You might start off and say, you know, I remember way back when, when I was in high school, I, I remember going forward at that retreat, and I was surrendered my life. I mean, I was already a Christian, but, but I really wanted to get serious about living for the Lord. I was doing some stuff I shouldn't do, and, and I really wanted to live for him and be a standout believer. But, you know, I got home, and I found out that things are a lot harder than they were when I made the commitment at camp. And I got tired, and I ran out of time, and I got very busy. And I remember I was sick. And I got zero encouragement from my friends. As a matter of fact, they were pulling me to go the other route. And then through one of a myriad of obstacles, I just gave up. And I wish I could tell you that that was the only time that ever happened to me. But that would be a repeated series over, 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 over multiple, multiple years. Has that, has that ever happened to you? where you made a commitment, you knew you were going to be different and you were going to do it right. You, want, you really did want to honor God. But then, because of some obstacle that came up or multiple obstacles, you just ran out of discipline and that commitment didn't last. Well, today, we're going to look at a young man who knew the secret to keeping those commitments. And, and if you and I understand this same secret... We too will be able to make our commitments for him to him, and we will be able to keep those commitments. And then you go ahead and you preach on the rest of David and Goliath's story. Or maybe you want to preach that text, but you're going to preach it inductively, right? And so you might start off and say, you know, it was it was not a typical day for David. A typical day for David would find him in the pasture. But today his father had sent him on an errand. An errand that would change the trajectory of his life. An errand that would change the trajectory of the nation of Israel. David would go away a boy and he would come back a man. He would understand what it meant to trust God. 
And then you just go through your, your, your message. You bring it all to a head, of course, at, at the end. But see, there's different ways you can go with, that, uh, with your message. And so understanding that makes a huge, a huge issue. Now, let me give you a final here word on transitions, because this is critical. Haddon used to tell us in class that the difference between a good message and a better message are the transitions. Listen, listen, transitions are the key for clarity for your congregation. A, a, a transition, well, here's what transitions do. They create clarity by acting as a verbal outline. Remember, you're not going to give your outline to your people. And so they're going to need verbal cues from you as to when you're moving from point A to point B. And they're going to need those verbal cues from you to tie the whole thing together. Think of transitions as verbal outline. Your people will appreciate this both today and at the gates one day. So transitions, they're, they're huge. Now, when used in the body, they incorporate a strong noun. Now, just stick with me. Uh, when you preach, you will often find that uh, you will want to have, uh, well, you'll find often that you're going to want to use the word thing, okay? Let's just say you're going to want to use the word thing. There are three things that we should know about God. There are three things that every believer should do. There are four things that anyone pursuing happiness would be about. There are five things that we should know about the Holy Spirit, right? We, we want to say thing all over the place, but listen, thing is a very, very weak word. It's a weak word. Avoid it like the plague, as it were. Do not use the word thing. Instead, there are, remember earlier, John 3, 16 message. There are three reasons why everyone should believe in Jesus. There are four characteristics of of, of God that will aid us in our uh, race for victory. There are uh, four secrets that uh, we need to understand and know to uh, discover the Holy Spirit. Whatever, but avoid things. That word is so overused that that word itself will be a turnoff for many of your people. Now, uh, let me give you just a reminder, our, our message we had on John 3, 6, remember there were three reasons why everyone should believe in Jesus and this is the way a transition works I give you point one I say on the, on the front end there are three reasons why everyone should believe in Jesus big idea was everyone should believe in Jesus there are at least three reasons this, this text t teaches us and here's the first reason and we should believe in Jesus because he is God's love gift for us and then I preach all about the love gift of, of God and then then my transition I said I say so the first reason why we should believe in Jesus is because he is God's love gift. But there's a second reason why we should believe in Jesus. We should believe in Jesus because he is God's son. And then I unpack all of the deity of Christ. When I get done doing that, I say, okay, so the first reason that we should all believe in Jesus is because he was God's love gift. Second reason we should believe in Jesus is because he's God's son. But there's a third reason why we should believe in Jesus, perhaps the most practically significant of them all, and that is because only in Jesus do we find eternal life. And see, as we give those transitions, we tell our people that we're moving from point A to point B. We're giving them the verbal outline, and it's making it very clear in their, in their life. Transitions. Hold the hands of your congregation and lead them through your logic. Now listen, our goal Right? We want to be biblical communicators. So the text that we have, the, co the copy, the content, we want that to be biblically rock solid. Right, That's very important. But, but we don't want to spew off biblically rock solid stuff that they don't understand. We've only got a short amount of time with them. We want to make sure that they are able to, to understand and to appropriate God's word clearly. And transitions and outline will help us get there. So let me pray for you as you continue on this week. Just to say thank you again, God, for those folk who came before us. We know, Lord, that these kind of things create a little bit more time in our studies. But we want to be, we want to be faithful stewards. 
with this task that you've given to us, we want to clearly, God, present your word to people in a way that they can understand and embrace that will result in life change. And so I pray, God, that even as we work through that this week, that you would change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.